apologize for not speaking French. It's, I, it's my refuge is my nationality. That I'm the closest foreign nation of serious um, single language uh, culture is, is Indonesia. And it's, it's very, very close to Australia. And they speak a different language <laughs> there to most others. Australia is a monoglot, or wasn't, at least when I was brought up in it, monoglot. And and you're looking at evidence of this in front of you. So I apologize, and uh, I hope it's not felt to be uh, um, demeaning, but uh, far from it. The, um, I w work naturally in classics, but I publish more these days uh, outside, the, outside the area. That may seem silly, because I complain about psychology a lot, but, but I, I um, blog periodically for psychology today along with many many other people but uh, um, that's that's how far I've drifted so you can see uh, the paper today talks about uh, uh, the modern world talks about the ancient world it I'm trying to show a single theme a very well-known theme particularly I think in French literature better known there than in uh, uh, than in English literature of, of the melancholic the sort of gestures the word that could almost be used, and they use it in psychological and neurological terms, is the phenotype, which uh, we, uh, we classicists know. We know what that means. But at any rate, so the phenotype is, is the visuals of a thing. You can, you can identify many emotions because of the phenotype. Friends spend time together. Friends collude together. Friends eat together. If they're monkeys, they spend a lot of time grooming. Those things are phenotypes. So you can't talk about the internals oftentimes, but you can talk about the externals for emotions. So it's the externals today, partly generic, partly, um, but partly phenotypical. So the, um, <coughs> the, the anything on melancholy seems to begin with, uh, with Duray, uh, Albrecht Duray. And this is from 1514. What he does is, he establishes, if you like, a, uh, a series of motifs that they're not his. They, many of them, or some of them, go back right back to antiquity, as we'll see. But nonetheless, it's what he seems to have done, the way I understand this, uh, this representation, is he takes a series of, uh, of cliches and he jumbles them all in together. He doesn't produce a logical or sequential narrative. So here's the angel of melancholy. That's the first thing. And with the typical posture of the melancholic or the bored person, the head on the, on the hand just here, she has an angry face and, of course, wings. The anger's an odd one. It's hard to find a clear parallel for, but, but they exist. This here is the planet of Saturn. So it's Saturn. The age of Saturn was a good thing in antiquity, but as it moved to the um, medieval period, the, uh, this becomes a symbol for Saturn, who is the, the, uh, uh, the god, the presiding god of melancholy. And it gives you the English Saturnine and so on. So dogs become associated pre and post Dure, but that's not a classical thing. She's an architect, is how it's usually understood. And these are the tools of her trade, the nails and so on here and the compass there. The putti, the single one here, you usually get them in uh, representations of melancholy pre dure and post dure. Um, <coughs> at the back, you can see the name of this, this very picture. It's melancholia number one. He never did a number two. I sort of like that, the idea of calling some, something number one and the rest of Western literature's hanging out for number two. And, you, and he says, no, nope, I'm not going to do it. And he didn't. Um, the ocean and a bat is flying with the, uh, uh, <coughs> with the banner there. 
I'll leave out the other, the other elements because some of them, you really, they're very hard to understand. But I think what he's doing is he's simply taking a series of, of elements, Puti, the bat, and so on, the ocean, and putting them together uh, without a logical narrative. So where's the classical link? Um, here is Rufus of Ephesus, who was as much as can be put together of Rufus on melancholy, was done by uh, Peter Poorman about six or seven years ago. And this is, this is a, as you can see, all typos are mine. It's not Rufus, but Rufus. Um, Rufus of Ephesus is, uh, is working sometime, let's say, in the second or so century. It's, uh, this is an Arabic fragment that uh, Pullman translated. And you can see here, um, <clears throat> where, are we, where are we down to? The reason for his illness was the constant contemplation of the geometrical sciences. That's what it did to me when I was a child, too. <laughs> He also had intercourse with kings. And what this means, I really don't know, but think about, perhaps think about a bad dean or a bad president or a bad provost and you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> because of these things, the melancholic uh, disease matter accumulated in him and so on. So if you think about Dure then, we have, there we have our geometer. So Dure's notion of the melancholic geometer the angel of melancholy, but that is a geometer, goes right back to here. The other link that comes in at this point is usually there's a, a connection made from here back to the pseudo-Aristotelian problema 30.1, which talks about a variety of people, um, outstanding individuals like Heracles, for example, who are melancholic. He mentions two philosophers, and philosophers, this is natural sciences, geometry, you're getting very close to it. He mentions Heraclitus, and he mentions Socrates. Who would know that Socrates is melancholic? But at any rate, that particular text, that was an extremely well-known one in the Middle Ages. So you put together Rufus of Ephesus, you put together um, the pseudo-Aristotelian problema, and you're starting to get the picture uh, that's close to a phenotype that, that runs right down into the 20th century. There was a huge exhibition by the French, um, the, the French art curator, art historian Jean Clair, a whopping great volume on it. And it was called just that, Melancholy. Um, it was about 90, 2004. He covers much of the same material, but not all of it. So if we were to go on from here, uh, these are the, the, the the elements that you can take out of Dure's picture that, that loosely relate to antiquity, but not necessarily. So the angel, the posture, this one here, and sometimes the, the direction the, uh, the head takes. The orb, that is to say the planet of Saturn, can be taken right out of the context of, the, uh, of our melancholy architect. And the polyhedron, which I didn't emphasize enough, but we'll see that again. The polyhedron's taken right out of the picture as a, an emblem, if you like, of melancholy. So if we looked at the angel first, this, is, um, this one here is, um, is Lucas Cranach, the Elder. And it's 15, um, I'm sorry, it's 1532, which is um, 16 years later than, uh, or 18 years later than um, Dure. You can see some of the elements here. This one, you know, it's the, the planet of, of Saturn. But we've got an angel here, don't we? There's the wings. And she looks a very cheerful angel indeed. And she's not doing geometry now. She's whittling. I don't know why, but whatever it is, the whittling in some manner or another in, in Cranach's mind is to be linked. Here's our dog. Here's our putty. It's an autumn scene which fits close to the the sort of Hippocratic notion, not quite, but to the Hippocratic notions of, of melancholy. And these dire figures there are, are, are seen as demonic possession and so on. So what's Lucas Cranach getting at? I don't think, again, that you've got a, a logical, worked out narrative. Lucas Cranach, as far as I know, 
ran a very busy and large studio. Not everything under his name did he paint, and not every element in the paintings would he have painted. So you could imagine him running his, um, uh, it's a room full of people like this, and he says, right, we've got an order for, uh, um, for melancholy. This is what I want you to do. You've got the dog, Patrick, <laughs> and, and so on. And someone says, shouldn't we have uh, um, some demonic stuff in it? Sure, sure, check the Bible, put it in. I think that's the way it worked. Um, <clears throat> But he produced this same picture quite a number of times. It's a little faded here. I'm sorry to say, but that's a, a beautiful red, the dress here, if, if you ever see another representation of it. But so here's Lucas Cranach very soon after. Is he based on Duray or is it independent? Probably independent. Here's one, and this is called Melancholy in the Garden of Life. I think it's... it's I spend a lot of time looking at it, but on a small screen, so I can't get all the elements. This one is, um, is from 1558. It's a little later, and it's too green here. She's wearing a, a red dress. But you can see what's happened. There's the figure of melancholy, which is what it says above. But her attributions, according to the, the lines that we've been dealing with, have been split. Here's our geometer down here. So here's the, the influence of, of what? Almost of the pseudo-Aristotelian notion of Socrates and Heraclitus, the philosophers, being melancholics, but particularly Rufus of Ephesus. Here's our geometer. You can see the compass in his hand. The, the picture is of as many aspects of human life as you could imagine. As I say, if, if we're not getting it in, in faded color, it's a, a beautiful. The colors in it are, are, are beautiful, extraordinarily striking. The figure of melancholy is an angel, as you can see, the wings there. But she has the left breast uncovered, which most books that I've looked up um, on the matter s indicates fertility. So if I said to you, the melancholy in the garden of life, you'd say this is the worm in the apple, would you not? The poison that ruins life. But whatever it is in this picture, it's a newish and strange tradition that's saying melancholy isn't such a bad thing. And I think if you pressed Matthias Geirung, he would have said, well, look at the benefits. You can become a philosopher, an architect. You can become like Socrates. You could even be like Heracles, because that's part of the tradition. Whatever he's doing, however, splitting the two figures and placing them in the center of a, a world, melancholy has given a, a fertile and happy role that it's probably never, ever had again. Who's ever going to tell you that being depressed is a good thing for you? Only this guy here. It's losing uh, Lucas, Lucas Cranach. So it, it, it's it's uh, losing Dura, however. This one is from about... No, I'll get the, 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 uh, the exact date right for you. It's, it's, um, it's 1997, and it's an angel, and it's by an Australian who works in London. Um, Muki is his name, and uh, Ron Muki, and some of you may have seen, you would have seen in the newspapers. He makes this would be an enormous figure or a tiny figure. He'll make pictures. There's a, a famous one. You see it in the papers all the time. A woman lying in bed in with the, the, the quizzical grief posture, the hands here. The head is about this large, so that when you view it in a gallery, um, the, the woman's figure, the recumbent figure, would take up all of the central part of the, uh, of the table here. So what have we got here? Here he's consciously adopting the wings from the tradition we're talking about. You might say, you're dreaming to it. It's not the case. I could show you other examples of, of the wings in modern art being linked uh, to the spirit of melancholy. The face is not a happy one. And we've got two hands um, on the face. And with Dure, you get just the one, the right hand with the head on the face. He's put two here. Mostly, if you talk about phenotypes, that's the the posture of, uh, of, of grief. But not here, I think. 
I think what he's doing is he's put both hands up because it suits him better. It produces a balance in the picture uh, that he admires. So here, you can believe me or not believe me. This is Paul Gauguin, faded again a little, but it's called Te Fatur Ruma, which means the, de the dejected one. And I think his pollination was about as good as my pollination. Well, as good as my spoken French, I think. I don't think he can be sure, but what he meant by the name, and he painted uh, and used the term twice, it's 1892 uh, that this picture comes from. There's the hand. It's the left hand in this case. There's a dog in the background. If you remember, it's, it's pressing it a bit, but there was a dog in Dure. There was a dog in Lucas Cranach, the elder. There's no beauty. I wonder sometimes if it's not the horse and whether the hat is not the planet of Saturn. Who would know? There's no wings here, and that's our theme. But then most of, uh, of Gauguin's life, he's a secularist, so he would move the, remove the wings. Is this part of the tradition? I like to think it is, but I can't prove it. And here, anybody just out of interest know who, who painted this? It's René Magritte, so we're into, this is 1932, it's called Homesickness, um, and here's our angel figure. Homesickness in most literature is associated with, with melancholy. It's a version of it. We could go into that, but we need and So that's what the, the figure here, our, uh, our angel, is feeling. He peers out into the foggy canal, wherever it is here. What's he homesick for? I guess what most angels are that are on Earth. He wants to go back to some sort of celestial sphere, and that's what's producing the melancholy in him. Does he have a, his head on his hand as he ought to have if he's out of the Dure tradition? You can't say. You really can't say. Strangely enough, the lion is evidence of what he feels. Now, the lion with the poor up, as some of you would recall, is the, the story that goes back to um, St. Jerome, <coughs> who uh, tamed the lion by removing the, li the, uh, the thorn out of the lion's foot. The lion then accompanied him to his study, which you may have seen the picture of, famous one by Jan van Eck. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the posture of, Dure, of, of, uh, of um, van Eck's um, St. Jerome is this. He looks at his books and he feels like we do. I think in my life, when it's, you know, preparing for the for the PhD exams, we have to read so much of Latin and Greek literature without any purpose to it. It's just, it seemed to go on for years, and uh, that's sort of how you felt at times, reading text you had little interest in, but you were going to be examined on. So what's he doing with the lion? He's signaling, uh, he's signaling to those who know it, and painters know these sorts of traditions, the tradition of melancholy. So that's what our our figure is here from 1932, and it's uh, astonishing to see the, the metamorphosis that's taken place. Here's one last one, which I pinched off of Wikipedia. Mock me as you like for this one, but the photograph is taken in 2008 at the, at the, uh, um, at the Mardi Gras in, uh, in Louisiana, and it's, it's simply entitled Kate as an Angel. The, uh, there's the halo up the top. There are some wings, if you can get them, behind her. She's got the, the angel's posture from Dure. We'll see it again so you can compare it. So whatever it is, the photographer here, who's just a person, knows the tradition well enough. And has got to say, look, Kate, put the hand here. And uh, um, you're an angel. You can be part of that tradition. So um, <clears throat> from Kate's angel, we go to this the head on the palm. There's Dure again. So that's the gesture we've been talking a, about a, a little bit. We've been talking mainly, or try, I was trying to aim, not to get too far away, from wings, that is to say, the link of the angel to this tradition that goes right back to Rufus of Ephesus and the pseudo-Aristotelian problema. The head on the hand we've talked about a lot, but here is, uh, is Democlides, and some of you will know the 
um, the, the picture, he died in. Now here I've got to look it up and not look at uh, and not look at Patrick for even a second because <laughs> he'll. It's a fourth century uh, funerary inscription. He's a hoplite, and you can see behind him is his shield and his helmet. He was killed apparently in the Battle of Corinth, which naturally I know everything about. Well, not at all. Here he is, and if you take a look at his posture, Democlides has the head on the palm of the hand. Now, uh, there's which way is he facing? It's got to be the right hand, the right hand. This matters in the iconography, whether it's the right or the left hand. It's got to be the right hand because of the way we're looking at him. If he had the left hand up, he'd be obscured from the picture. Is this melancholy? Naturally, people like me say, yes, 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 of course it is, but it's not. It's grief in this case. Here's the dead man grieving over his own death, and that's the stern of the ship uh, indicating the circumstances in which he's been killed. So it's a self-referential painting, but here we've got the gesture of mourning mixed up with melancholy and I don't know who reads Freud anymore, but uh, one of his most famous essays was Mourning and Melancholia. He tries to show how the two are extremely similar, but different. I guess the argument comes down in the end is that um, mourning has an end point. People get beyond it. Melancholia doesn't. But from what Freud was saying there, and this is not one of his nuttier ones, the imagery, the feelings are virtually indistinguishable. So there's our Greek tradition coming back into it, and much earlier than the pseudo-Aristotelian problema and Rufus of Ephesus. Here is, you could probably tell me if I didn't ask you, anyone want to say who this author is, just out of interest? Painter, I should say, not author. Do you know? It is, it is, it's Monk. And it's about 1890, uh, 1891, 92. Here's our melancholy figure. It's a man called Jappe Nielsen. So it's, it's a Norwegian scene, and he's melancholy over who knows what, but it's the left hand. The painting is called Melancholy. There's a second version, which was called Jealousy in the Yellow Boat. In this case, here's our boat. It looks a bit more red in this picture. The woman in white's name, and this is going to kill my brain to remember it, is... Uh, um, uh, I'm going to have to look it up. The um, it's Oda uh, Oda yeah Oda Krug I think Oda Krug and her husband Mira is um, his name is Christian. Now they ran a sort of a uh, what would you call it a um, an artist colony in this particular portion of of Norway that he was that is that Munk himself was mixed up with. Jappe Nielsen's beef in this picture is, is that they had an open marriage, um, Frida and um, Olga, did I say, and, uh, and Christian, and he was the lover of the woman there. But whatever it is, they're going off on a tryst, according to the commentaries on the painting, in that little boat out to an island, and he's consumed with, not melancholy, but jealousy. Um, I had to get it in, but even so, what it's showing is, is that this tradition that goes right back to uh, uh, via uh, Durer, earlier figures, back to Rufus of Ephesus, can be twisted and changed. So Munch's happy to call this melancholia. He knows the posture. He knows exactly what it is. He knows the colors are right for it. But it's actually a painting about jealousy. You've got to be told this because if you didn't know who these two figures were, it's next to meaningless. Until you look at the other picture, jealousy and the yellow boat, which is pretty much the same, the same thing as here. Well, because you know, painted um, the same scenes again and again and again. This one I put on the colours here. This should be red. Um, it's Pierre Bonnard, as you can see the name here. It's from the 1930s, and that's Jean-Baptiste Corot from um, <coughs> that I should look up. That's an, he, he's an, an 18th century, but it's 1860. Now, why I put this in was because this is called uh, the melancholic woman, and that's called simply the striped blouse. It 
if I, uh, if I stop talking now and drop dead, which at my age is always on the cards, one shouldn't make jokes about it, but well, why not? You'd have understood a huge amount of what I'm saying. Now, if I were to come over to here and sit down, which I'll do for a minute, and that'll kill off a few more slides, but once again, this might be the big message. This is, I've talked to neuroscientists about this and they'll have not a drop of it, but there's some truth to it. This is a pen or it's a fork, whatever she's got, um, Bonnard's um, painting of the left hand. The head's here on the left hand if you're right-handed. If you're left-handed, it's got to be swapped. But we're assuming most people are right-handed for, for this sort of representation. The bored person's head goes to here. Their hand is occupied fiddling with something or doodling with something or just twisting about. So the right hand, the action hand, as it were, will be free. The head goes on to the, the, the non-dominant hand, the left hand, and the gaze is usually um, cast slightly up. And there's a name for it in English. It's called the Antarctic stare um, or the 12-foot gaze in a 10-foot room. If you think about it, you, you know exactly what I mean. Many of you have been to many meetings in your life. And how often have you sat there yourself, sort of focusing on the back wall, but a little beyond it? So if I were to do it here, my eyes would raise to the back wall and I'd look slightly through it. It can be, the gaze can be down, but it's never right down here. So the board gaze is committed to something, though it's whatever it is, they're not allowed to get to it now because they're in some way or another, they're circumscribed as this young woman is here. She's wearing a red dress with white stripes on it. The hand fiddles because the bored person is still committed to the wall. Their situation is temporary. That's how it's represented in art. That's the archetypal. There's many, many examples. If you think I'm making this up, I shouldn't have got up. The bored person is right-handed in this case or left-handed, but the dominant hand is going to be the right hand if they're right-handed, and the head will then control the movement of the hand by being placed in it. This is true as far back as we're doing it, except in Democlides case. So the hand goes on to here, and the gaze directs down to here. So when we haven't got the Antarctic gaze, not the 10-foot gaze in the, or the 12-foot gaze in the 10-foot room, the, uh, the head has to be down and you normally will place, this is about 65% true, on the dominant hand. And that's what you've got with Koro here. The, uh, it's the right hand that, well, as you can see her head's there and the gaze is not outwards but downwards. And that you can, you can, uh, that you can tell. How do I know this? Through thousands of hours of looking at pictures, it truly works. So when you next go to a meeting and you see someone with their hand on their face, check which hand it is. Then check whether they're right or left-handed. And uh, you'll know how they're feeling. If they're like this, you need to worry because you're boring, the, you're boring them half to death. Um, sorry, this one. When your audience is doing this, you're just in trouble. Right? It's, it's, it's beyond, it's, yawning's the worst, is it not? This is if you're a teacher, you're teaching, everybody's yawning. Um, but then there's a phase called the sub-yawning phase. I just invented that again. The sub-yawning phase, as the hand goes on to here, then they're bored beyond redemption. But anybody in the same audience who's right hand and got their head here, you know, you should be talking to psychological services for them because <laughs> the problem is, is otherwise. Why should you link boredom with, uh, with melancholy? Here's the answer, and there is psychological literature on this, or it's ethological literature, it's work done on animals. Boredom that is prolonged, particularly boredom that's been prolonged without the possibility of break, is melancholy. You can see this with animals. So unrelieved boredom is melancholy. So the two emotions run hand in glove. So <coughs> if you're boredom, you're locked in this room for 50 years, is without relief, you're going to swap sides and it's going to go on to there. You lock an animal in a cage, its reactions seem to go through boredom, anger, 
there's the face in Dure, and then depression or melancholia. So here's another one. This is uh, this is uh, the, the name is Edgar Lebar. He is English though, and this is painted in England, and it's painted in 1940, which could probably uh, make you start to guess what's going on here. So it's an English pub, men in uniform there and there. So it's the very beginning of the Second World War in a, in a bar, a saloon, it's called saloon bar, somewhere in England. Now, if you check the glasses, you can start to figure out what the significance of the head on the palm is. Here's one and here's one. She's drinking something like sherry. Her companions are drinking brown ale and, and, and lager. They've gone off, presumably, to, uh, to play darts. Isn't that what everybody does in English pubs? And she's been left and she's been hit upon by this Humphrey Bogart figure. I swear he looks like Humphrey Bogart uh, behind her. Is she disgusted? Boredom's length is disgust, or is she just plain uh, bored with what he's going on about? Is she bored because her companions have gone off to play darts? You can't really tell, but the tradition's here. Her head's, her hands on her right hand, um, on her right hand, right arm palm. It couldn't be on the left, however, because it'd obscure her face, just as we saw with Democlides. So. Sometimes the way you're representing things are going to define the particular arm that you'll use. What's she feeling? I don't know. Is she part of the tradition that goes back to Rufus of Ephesus? Yes. How can we be sure of that? When people learn like this man, an academic painter as he was, learn to paint, they learn by imitation. They know the tradition um, in, a, in, a, in a way like uh, where we are aim to know Latin or Greek or people in French or English literature know the full tradition. The, um, this is back to the, to the orb just to show you some representations of the, of the planet of Saturn and how this actually persists and stays with us. This is a medieval tradition so we're losing Rufus of Ephesus but whatever it is um, the, the Rufus tradition, the pseudo Aristotelian tradition, lives on with additions. And in, and in unexpected places. This is uh, Jacques de Gain, and it's from, it's from I think about 18, 1588, and here is our planet of Saturn underneath. That's what he's sitting on. You can see the compass here that he has there with another globe there. You can see the head on the hand and the gloomy face. And there's a, a, an inscription on this uh, particular painting that says, and I'll read it to you, melancholy, a bitter affliction of the spirit and mind often accom uh, accompanies strength of ability and genius. That's the, uh, the pseudo-Aristotelian tradition. So this is straight out of it, but with the addition here. So the sentiment's purely classical, you could say, but it's changed. And you wouldn't know this was the Saturn that he's sitting on unless you, unless you had an interest in, the, in this particular tradition. Here's Luke. This is a different Lucas Cranach the Elder. As I said, he, he, ran, a, you know, he, he ran an industry, great painter, but this is not the one we saw. If, if you could, she's still whittling here. Um, our angel of melancholy. We've got the dog. Here's the putty. The ball there is the, uh, is the planet of Saturn in the center. And we've got the, the demonic possession rolling across an autumnal landscape or a winter landscape. All I can think of with these putti is that they have a pretty good life. Whenever you see them in these sorts of things, everybody else is beginning to look gloomy and they're having fun. This is about 1480, so it's earlier than um, Dure. And it's by Bellini, perhaps. It's called Melancholy or Fortune. How will we know the melancholy is there? Simply that. Just puts it in, that's the signal. They all got it at once. We don't because we've lost the tradition. 
This is from about, I should check the date. It's, it's, it's about 1930. The painter is an Italian called Serrani. And uh, the uh, picture is called, is called Melancholy. That's its, its, its actual title. It's not called Solitude. There's the planet of Saturn right there. But you can see what he's trying to do produce a, uh, a devastated landscape that will match the way um, he feels the melancholy woman would be feeling. Why is it a woman? Why is she unclothed? We have the link that's common between women and melancholy, not saying, I think, that women are more melancholy than men. It's just a tradition um, that persists, uh, at least in the, the artistic world. There is a sexualization of melancholy that goes on periodically in many eras. I don't know why, but it is part of the tradition. There's no doubt about it. So her nakedness here is part of that sexualizing of the tradition. Um, <clears throat> you'd almost miss it and think, think it's an egg or a decoration. Cerrone knew it, he played it down, he just pushed it in as if to say, and if you're in doubt what this woman is suffering from, there's the planet of Saturn. This is, uh, and this came out really well, the colours have come through, so it must be something to do with the, the quality of copies I've made. Anybody know this painter? We, ha we had the painter before. It's René Magritte again, it's about 1821, uh, sorry, 1921, and it's called The Bather. So this is Magritte in his earliest phase, his uh, uh, most, I don't know, I think his most fertile, and in some ways simplest. Here she is, there's the beach in the background. Um, we've got the figure in a bathing costume resting here. I promise you, beach balls don't rest as well as, as, as this one is doing on the column there. And you say, how does Magritte know the tradition of the, uh, of the planet of melancholy Saturn, that is to say? I think the answer to that is how could he not know it? Uh, it's such a dominant tradition in the artistic uh, world. Could it be a beach ball? I don't know. Did they have beach balls in the 1920s on, uh, on Belgian beaches? Uh, I, I couldn't tell you. But it, it is, I think, it's fair to say, another example of this tradition we've been dealing with, that is to say, of the planet of melancholy. Is it sexualized here? You can take your pick, but I'd say it is. He's used a woman. <coughs> She's in a, a bathing costume. Uh, the, uh, the, the symbol for melancholy is in the background. There it is. He's, uh, um, there's nothing surreal in this painting. Uh, which is what we're going to get later in his work. But nonetheless, he puts in the signal in case you're in doubt that what we're dealing with here is, in fact, a melancholy woman. But there's only one element in the painting, thanks to Dure and others, that we'd, we'd get it from. And this one, some of you must have seen the movie. Does anybody know it? You've got a, do you know it? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Lars von Trier. Yeah. Yeah, um, so it is Lars von Trier, and the movie was from 2011. I can't, you know, I'm, I'm beyond looking at maybe it's age or taste. I don't know. The famous recent ones are *Nymphomania* one, two, and three. Are they not? I can't, I can't cut it even on Netflix for nothing. This is this is sort of mid-range, uh, uh, <coughs> mid-range Lars von Trier, who's a pretty nutty guy, as as some of you will know. Funny man, but. A, a strange one. So a Danish uh, film director. This was a film about a planet called Melancholy that by the end of it, and this is a still from the very end of the movie, that's Kirsten von Dunst there, and the two other people in the, the picture, her sister in the movie and her son there, they're waiting in this uh, imitation teepee for the, the great planet of Melancholy to consume the Earth. Is this great uh, uh, planet of melancholy the, the planet of, of Saturn? 
I think it is actually. And you can, it's a long sort of argument, but uh, Lars von Trier might be a, 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 a crazy man in his private behavior, but he's an extremely learned guy. His films, and this one, are full of references to other films, full of references to artistic traditions. What he's doing is his whole film is playing off this notion of the Saturn, the planet of melancholy. So that orb that we've been seeing right back to, um, right back to Dure and proceeding with Bellini. It's not a classical notion, but here is, is about its most recent incarnation. Everything explodes soon after this when the, when the people in the film are, um, are destroyed. It's a good movie, you know. If, if you were to watch one film by Lars von Trier, I would think, you know, th that's that's it's the, him and his most approachable. Here's the polyhedron, and that's the polyhedron there. I don't know where it comes from. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, it becomes fixed in the iconography of melancholy, and it gets taken out of this. Um, this situation and presented as just that. Now this is, um, let me see if I can get you the, the right date for, for this. This is from, it's, it's from Poland in a public park in the town called Tarnow and it's from 2013. And the name of this public statue is, you could probably tell me, Melancholy. Why? He's simply taken the polyhedron if we were to go backwards, the polyhedron right there in Dure's picture and abstracted it, placed it in a public park and no one would be any the wiser. I've often thought you see this in a public park and if you're standing for municipal election in Calgary, they're going on at the minute and there's a man saying, public art, no one should pay for public art, only philanthropists should, the city's money shouldn't be paid in it. And you think, yeah, great, yeah, let's not have parks, let's not have uh, public anything then, um, just spread tar. But you can imagine people going, th like that man, going through the park and looking at this and saying, more modern art, the trouble with modern art, no one understands it. And, we shouldn't spend money on it. And then you stand and say, I'm sorry, mate, that is not modern art. That dates back to 1514, this image. It's as old as anything. And it's, the, uh, it's this one of the symbols for melancholy out of the picture um, by, um, <clears throat> by Dure. And here, I think this is... Uh, almost meretricious in its simplicity. It's by Anselm Kiefer, a German artist. Where's our polyhedron? Right there. What's it sitting on? A pretty gnarled looking B-52 bomber. Now Anselm Kiefer's youth is in the Vietnam War. And this is a commentary on, on American exceptionalism, American expansionism, what it did in Vietnam. So he's a highly politicized artist. And um, this is, it's as if this has been crashed in the Cambodian jungles, but let's imagine it hasn't. But what will this plane do for you if you're Cambodian or anybody else in the period it's uh, uh, painted? It's going to make you melancholy. And that, I think, is a bit, uh, a bit trite, but you may feel otherwise. You wouldn't get the painting, though, would you? Unless you knew what the polyhedron stands for and where it's come from. I don't know. I, I'm always tempted at times like this to get everybody to vote. Is this good or is this bad? I won't do it. It's rude. I always get my students to do it. It's the only way you ever know what they're thinking. But so that's Anselm Kiefer, and that's the end of the, um, of the tradition that runs from, um, that, that runs from um, Dure onwards. The neck really matters. There's two others that matter in this long tradition of melancholy and that matter both classically and in terms of modern literature. The neck, the melancholy neck, is as simple as this. It's like this. I don't think it matters which way you go. Kale's imitating it as we do it. Just watch Kale. Now tilt again. Perfect. That's it. Cast your gaze downwards. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> this is something that you can see in classical art and you can see in modern. And this is Albrecht Dürer. That's from 
I think uh, 1508 or thereabouts, 1506, this is the 12 year old uh, Christ, I guess, looking forward to what he knows is going to befall him. It's, um, <coughs> Dura had a good line on melancholy, is all I can say. The head is tilted to the right. You wouldn't necessarily know what it is, but instinctively you'd say, that is not a, a happy Christ. And then you'd say, why? But the way he's done it is to present him as part of a tradition that links the neck and the tilt of the neck with what we've got here. Now here's going back to antiquity. This is, I think, either fifth or fourth century. It's a white figure for uh, Lekuthos um, representation. The, the person here, the woman, you can see the necklace, is probably the person who's in this funerary urn right here. So it's once again self-referential in the same way that Democlides was. The eyes are sad. Well, so would you be if you were dead too, I guess. Um, but we've got the tilt in the neck once again. So we've gone back, what, 1900 years and the tradition persists. Is it a tradition or is it a phenotype? Is it the reality of melancholy? You decide. But I think, in fact, you're getting close to an actual real representation. Here's a second one by, um, by Gauguin. Once again, it's from 1992, 1892, I should say. Everything happened in 1892. I'm not kidding you. August Strindberg, who had a pretty good line in things like melancholy himself, took a trip to Paris and spent some time there. Then he went back to Sweden and said, you know what? The x-ray was invented in Paris during the time I was there. And they said, what's an x-ray? That's remarkable. Many things like this were invented in this period. And Strindberg said to them, and you know what else? And they said, what else? I invented it. I guess you could say that in Sweden in 1892 and people would believe you. It must have been a bit off the beaten track. But that's what he bragged. This is a course in um, somewhere like Samoa uh, and it's called Fatur Uma. Once again, same as the picture we saw earlier, the dejected woman. There's the tilt of the neck. And this is in English, what she's dressed in is called the, uh, the missionary dress. It was what the, uh, the Christian missionaries um, persuaded the naked Polynesians to wear. And so I think what he's doing is making a little comment in this picture about um, colonization, French colonization in this case, and the, uh, what? the destruction of the happiness of a native people. So you've got the, the Polynesian figure in the missionary dress. You've got Christianity causing what, the tilted neck, the melancholy, and so on. This is uh, a, uh, a Swiss painter called, uh, um, his first name is Barrow, it's Francis Barrow. Do you, do you know the painter at all? He died at 30, he, was, he had a, a pretty tough life. It's Fran uh, Francis, it's a picture of his wife, Marie, and it's from about, uh, about 1930 odd, she wasn't melancholic. Barrow was as melancholy as the day is long, depressive, that is to say, in his case. He's got his wife to adopt the posture, and there's the neck again. It's the white figure posture, the one that Cow was imitating for us down there for a moment. Um, so it's persisting right back to the fifth century, but without the intermediary in this case of the pseudo. Um, uh, the pseudo-Aristotelian problema or of Rufus of Ephesus. He died at 30 of tuberculosis. I find it very sad, really. He was a working class painter, he and his brothers. He could just do it. He studied a little in Paris, ran short of money and went back to his trade, which was as a house decorator. He painted walls for a living, returned to Switzerland and carried on painting walls and then developed um, Developed, the, um, developed his tuberculosis and died. If ever you get a chance though, he's a, a, a great, great painter and unfairly forgotten. This is from 2009 and the figure, this in Swedish, it's news to me. Anybody able to pronounce Swedish in here? Something like Sverrmurth or something. 
it means it, it is it's also labeled in the books as, as melancholia it looks like a person who's been hung does it not hung, the neck breaks the head tilts it's exactly the same tradition that we've been looking at it goes right back to our uh, uh, white figure lekuthos um, that i showed you as part of it we're nearly uh, nearly at the end of me and um, there's not too many heads on, on hands yet. You're being polite. It's once you know it, I, I saw that. <laughs> you become incredibly nervous about it. You're sitting there, oh my goodness me, I've got my hat and my face on. I can't do that. This is depression and music. And it's a two-pronged tradition. One depression as a player and one depression as a remedy. But this is Rufus of Ephesus once again. And it's simple, it's saying the symptoms of melancholy from which he suffered were sadness and fear of death. I therefore ordered amusement and music. Eight days afterwards, he was saved. There was a little more to it than this, but that's the core of the message. So um, there's something to it. I asked a class, this was about 100 students, I said, no, it was a much bigger one than that. I got them to vote, and I like to do this. And I said, what do you... Where, from what do you draw most solace? Is it Netflix? I got about 30% of hands up. Is it Friends? I got 45%. Is it Music? And I got something like 70% of the class. Um, so whatever it is, Rufus is onto something here. He's reporting in these case studies. This is an Arabic fragment. This is from it's from a manuscript of Aristotle's um, De Somno et Vigilia. And it's an illustration in the manuscript. It's medieval. But you can see what's happening here. The violinist is trying to cheer up our melancholy individual here. So look at the eyes. They're going in the direction you'd want them. Look at the hand. It's the right hand uh, propping the head. You'd say, no, he's sleeping. No, he's not. Uh, this is a medical cure that we're watching here. And the artist knows it. And uh, it's part of the long tradition. This, this is um, Ekaterina. She was a Russian aristocrat. She's not melancholy here at all. Uh, Ekaterina Petrovna Demidova. She's very well married, uh, very well connected, very wealthy woman. Died in her early 40s after having had a number of children. Her husband had a pretty stellar career in the Russian public service. She was musical. And this picture simply sets the scene for the next one. Would you think she's melancholy here? Not necessarily, but she probably was. The tradition's coming, the painting's coming out of the tradition. It's linking music not to a cure of melancholy but as one of the attributes of a creative personality so this is the pseudo aristotelian problema where you've got socrates and heraclitus as the great creative figures then um and the same with uh, uh, with rufus of ephesus melancholy in some manner or another or depression is associated with being creative in her case, it's the guitar and uh, or whatever that is. And there's the hand giving it away. The face is, uh, uh, fits. But there's uh, uh, here, this is one. Uh, this is um, uh, Pruszkowski. It's from 1925, and it's simply called Melancholy. So here he comes out and tells us what's going on here. The tradition. There's your hand, there's the musical instrument, the music here. It's not perfect for, for what I'd hope you'd seen it, but nonetheless, it's the combination of creative ability, if not quite genius, something close to a creative ability and genius and melancholy. And that's the tradition that this Polish painter is playing on here. And this one, as I say, goes way, way back, directly back to uh, classical antiquity. Music has been substituted. Instead of music being the balm, the solace, here it is the reflection of the creative ability. Here's my last slide, or my last picture. This is Marc Chagall. And some of you will know this picture and be able to explain it much better than I can. Believe me, you can. He's holding the Torah, 
there's the prayer, the, 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 the uh, prayer shawl, and there's the hand. And it's the right hand, is it not? And look at the gaze. It's downwards. So whatever it is, he's a depressive, he's melancholic about who knows what. Some people, this is called solitude, the painting. It's 1933. Some people link the, the melancholy to the increasing anti-Semitism of the period. Um, Chagall had left Russia by this point and was living, I think, in Paris. And here he is. Here's the solace for melancholy. Here's a, uh, a cow. And I do not, not know what the tradition is there, playing in the violin. You've got to like it a lot. It doesn't seem to have worked, however, but one could, one could only hope, and there's a, an angel in the sky. The tradition, though, as I've been saying, is classical. It's straight out of, uh, <coughs> straight out of the, uh, above all, Rufus of Ephesus, and there must have been many others. There are intermediaries in the Middle Ages. Some of you will know Robert Burton's book, The Anatomy of Melancholy. It's the sort of thing that everybody owns and would like to read. It's a huge thing. It's pretty funny and pretty boring. At any rate, he refers to Rufus a lot. And he also makes the link between genius and melancholy. So if we were to finish and, and put some of these things together, here are some conclusions, some of which work. Some are, are more relevant than others. But you can see um, melancholy has been associated through much of its tradition, melancholy in the sense of, of black bile has been associated with depression proper. Um, it's associated with mourning, we've seen it. We've seen it associated with boredom, but the mourning really matters. I haven't put here, we've also seen Munch taking it up for jealousy. Get too jealous, you're going to feel depressed. Um, <clears throat> The um, personification of melancholy is more frequently female than male. It has a link very occasionally with anger. And that works with the ethological literature. Lock up an animal, it goes through the phases of boredom, anger, then depression. But the anger proceeds. So, you know, cockatoos and birds that are locked in cages self mutilate, do they not? They pluck their feathers out. Uh, for a time, but that passes and they sink into melancholy. It's connected with intellectual excellence, and that's the, the big theme here, especially geometry, but also music, and to a degree, philosophy. We haven't seen much of this, but it's linked with intellectual exuberance. I'd go right back to melancholy in the garden of life for that. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes with sexual desire. Magritte plays on that, I think. It's also linked in Christian representations, and I haven't talked about that at all, with sin, acidi, acadia, whatever, you, whatever word you want to use for it. And that's, uh, that's all I've got to say. Thank you for being a patient audience and really polite. Every head should have been uh, on the hand by the end of this. And nobody yawned. I don't get it. Um, you were suppressing them, but thank you.